Thanks for having me. And it's my pleasure to lead you in worship this morning. So um, can we just donate our time right now? Just come before God and let's just give him our heart. Give him our mind. Uh, God, thank you for this gorgeous morning that you, that you have provided. Uh, another day of life. Scripture says your mercies are new every morning. And we bask in that. Father, I pray this morning we wouldn't just sing words coming out of our mouth, but a reflection of what's happening in our heart. Um, I don't know what everyone's going through, but you do. You know everything about us. And I pray that our worship as a congregation would be a sweet aroma to you, Father. And we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. God, that's what we want to do this morning. We just want to shout about your goodness, about your grace, about your mercy. May that come from a, a heart that's full of gratitude this morning. And we give you all the praise. As we sing this next song, uh, just let the words uh, bless you as we sing to God. Search the world, but it couldn't find me. A man's empty praise, treasures of pain, and never enough. So true, and you came along. Amen. Put me back together, and every desire. Is now satisfied here in your love. Lift your voices. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Can we sing that again? Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and pride. I will say no more. You still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain, still God, is the God of the valley. Just the voices. Oh, there's nothing. 
sing. Oh, there's nothing. Ain't nothing better. Sing. Nothing is better than you. Sing that again. Just the voices. Sing. Oh, there's nothing. Sing that. We're not ashamed of the gospel. All right, let's add the band. Let's sing that again. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing. Love singing truth with God's people. Amen. We're going to take the offering at this point, so you can grab your seat there. Let's just leave this in some prayer this morning. Father, there is nothing better than you, and just the simplicity of that sentence is crushed by the awesomeness of who you are when we think about a holy God, a sovereign God. And uh, Father, Scripture says... You and the cattle and the thousand hills. Everything that we do, everything that we have, the air that we breathe is because of you. And Father, this offering we take is just, just a small token, really, of what you blessed us with. I pray that you would bless each person here as they give and that you would be honored in it. We give you all that praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers can come down. Glorify, glorify the name of 
I glorify name of all names and nothing and nothing can stand again can't stand against I choose to praise to glorify glorify the name of all names and nothing can stand against yes I will yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless your name Give him the glory. Let's just bow our heads real quick, Father. Thank you so much for what you do in our lives and through this church. I do pray for the leadership. I do pray for Pastor Andy, the elders, all who work behind the scenes. I pray that you would bless their ministry and bless what they do. And in this church and with these people, we give you all the glory in your son's name. Amen. And gracious Heavenly Father, King of Glory, um, we want to thank you for who you are. And Father, we know that this is not the end of the story for Sophia. We know it's only the beginning of a glorious life in your presence. And so, Lord, we are praying for your peace, your comfort, for the Garcia's family. We uphold Pastor Andy right now as he comes alongside Terry, you give him the words to say, words of comfort, more so to be there just to listen to her. And so, Lord, I pray that your peace that surpasses every understanding will come into that home. You bring healing to their hearts and that your will will be done. We thank you, Lord, for this church family for the way that we grieve, we do not grieve like the world does. For we know we have a hope in you. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, death is definitely something um, that happens to every single one of us. And um, when I got the text from Pastor Andy. I was actually at a good news club um, that afternoon. I, he called me and I couldn't attend to his call. And the text just said, hey, can you step in this Sunday for me? And something came up. In that moment, I thought, man, what could have just suddenly come up? And um, I tried to call him back and then um, he texted me and said, um, one of the elders, Jim, will fill me in because he was able to talk to Jim at the time. And just when I found out what had happened, uh, my heart uh, ripped apart. Um, she's only 27 years old, and death claimed her life. And I thought in that moment, I, we have messages that, you know, we've taught in the past and all of that, but I haven't ever taught a message on death, and the only place you could go to where you would see hope shed to the light that the darkness of death brings to this world is in the book of John. It is when we encounter Christ and we see who he is, the giver of life, the resurrection, and the life. And so I thought that, hey, how quickly can I put this together? And so, yeah. The Lord gave me the words to say, so bear with me. It could be short, and it could be, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm going to look through the book of John, chapter 11. But a quick background of the book of John. The book of John is a book that literally focuses on the deity of who Christ is. It's a book with no shadow of doubt 
that points to Christ as the Messiah that God promised to send. The full reason, the whole reason why John wrote that book, and some people debate, could it be John who wrote the book? I'm not here to debate that. The book says the book of John. <laughs> so I would attribute that to John. And John believed that Jesus is God, very God. The beginning of that book start in John 1.1. 1, 1. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He's establishing the even in his introduction that Jesus is God, very God. He was the word of God incarnated. And as the book goes on, it starts to reveal that Jesus is the great I am. The book is also known <clears throat> to be one of the only book that puts all of the I am that Jesus claims to be in it. And those great I am established that he was the God of the whole Testament, and he is the God who is with us here on earth right now. The seven I am's that is written in the book of John. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 6, verse 35, 41, 48, and 51, Jesus claimed to be the bread of life. Jesus also said, I am the light of this world, helping us to realize that he's the only one who shed light in this world. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. John chapter 10, verses 7 and 9. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verses 11 and 14. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6. And finally, Jesus said, I am the true vine. John chapter 15, verses 1 and 5. I am, meaning that the God who revealed himself to Moses is the God who incarnated himself in the Son of God. The Word became flesh. God, very God. But today, we want to focus on the fifth I am, the resurrection and the life. And as we look through that fifth statement of Jesus, perhaps claiming to say, I am the resurrection and the life. He claimed that during the greatest miracle that he will perform that foreshadow what would happen to him himself in the resurrection of Lazarus. Well, people have said that Jesus did resurrect two other people before he did Lazarus. But there is a huge difference, and there are debates as to the little boy whose mom was taken to the tomb. That boy just died. He wasn't in the tomb yet. There was another damsel, a young girl, who Jesus resurrected as well. But the cases are different because they weren't dead for as long as Lazarus was dead. They weren't in the tomb for four days. And so people have their speculation about, is that really a resurrection? Well, if that is not enough, then this is the key point of the capstone of the greatest public miracle that Jesus will do. And perhaps the very last one he did physically to the people around him, aside from his resurrection. And before we go on to that very statement where Jesus said he is the resurrection and the life in John chapter 11, verse 25, it is only fair that we go back to see what led to that. What was transpiring, what was going on in, in the book of John chapter 10? At the closing, the religious leaders were already seeking to stone Jesus to death. They were seeking his life because he claimed to be God, very God. They picked up stone and they wanted to stone him to death. And so Jesus, knowing that his time wasn't right yet, and man cannot take his own life unless he lays it down, 
he left. And the Bible in chapter uh, 10, verse 40, said that they escaped and crossed to the Jordan River, making their way to the other side. There's a map here on the screen just to give you an idea of the distance because sometimes people question the scripture. Well, the scripture is so true that even in today's world, if you take out your GPS and try to figure out the distance between them, you will see that it is so true. When Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem, where they were going to be stoned to death, they actually went across the Jordan River where John the Baptist used to teach at or baptize at. And there Jesus was teaching. And that place is also called Bethany. And so as he escaped to that place, waiting and teaching, we see that in verses 11, chapter 11, something was happening to a man named Lazarus. He was ill. He was sick. Mary and Mather know Jesus very well. They've hosted him in, in their house multiple times. They know who Jesus is. They've listened to his teaching. They're fully aware of the miracles that he's done, turning water into wine. They know that Jesus is God, very God. And so they send forth the word to Jesus in John chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. The one that you love is sick and at the verge of death. And what did Jesus do? Jesus told them that this sickness will not lead to death. That this sickness was to reveal the glory of God in verses 4. And then Jesus and his disciples stayed two more days where they were in verse 6. They stay there. Why? Why would Jesus stay there? I think this miracle was going to be something that he wants to help his disciples to grow their faith. He wants them to understand that he has the power to resurrect a decaying body. Scientifically impossible. When someone is dead for four days, they are dead and dead. Dead as it could be. The green emissions and liquid, they are bacteria that is already going on. It will take a two days journey from where Jesus was to Bethany. And so when they waited two days, it is always accurate that you can see that the Bible says that they got there four days after Lazarus was in the tomb. The Bible is so accurate and so true. And while Jesus told his disciples that they should go to Bethany, his disciples were freaking out. Dude, they almost just stoned you to death. You know, it's only two miles away from Jerusalem. And at this time, there are ways we look at the characters in the Bible. Maybe a little background of who Mary and Martha is. They are not poor people. Bethany is known to be a very good suburban area close to the temple. It's only two miles away. It's not a place where poor people live. If you remember, Mary is the same person who anointed Jesus' feet with a very expensive oil, where Judas Iscariot said, that is a one-year wage worth of perfume that you've just wasted. Well, he, she wasn't, he wasn't saying the truth. He wanted the money for himself. Where did Mary get that oil? A one-year wages. Martha hosted Jesus, invited Jesus into her home in John chapter 6, where he called them and entertained them and cooked, and that was where she was claiming, hey, why is my sister sitting at your feet and not come to me? Help me. So they are known to be very um, well-to-do, well-off. That's why she's able to send messengers to Jesus and all of that. And so when the disciples heard that they were going to Bethany, they were afraid. They know that a lot of people will be at Bethany right now, especially the Jews. 
It is customary for people to come and wail and cry. And sometimes you pay people to actually cry for the lost one, if you can afford it. For seven days, people have to wail and cry for the dead in their family, mourning that person. So it made no sense that Jesus wanted to go two days after he was told. His disciples were thinking, at this point, a lot of people will be there, wailing and crying, especially the religious leaders. We are going to be stoned to death. But yet, Jesus was going to go. Thomas, who doubted, Thomas was the one who said, is called Thomas the doubting Thomas, actually said, let's go. Let's go and die with him. You know, while I was reading that passage, I thought of the many ways that Thomas could have said those words. And only two ways come to mind. Could he be sarcastically speaking? Okay, let's go and die with this dude. He could say it that way. Or he could say, let's go and die with him. Because we love Jesus. We don't want him to be by himself. I think the latter might be accurate. Let's go with him and die with him. And as Jesus and his disciples approached the town of Bethany, Martha, probably people knew Jesus in that town because he's been to that town many times and anyone could have ran and told Martha and Mary that Jesus is in town. The Bible said that Mary sat back while Martha said she was going to go. She ran and hurried up. People thought that she was going to cry at the tomb that the dead body will be put in. They said, let's go with Martha, but she was going to the Savior. And that brings us to verses 17 of John chapter 7, where that conversation between Jesus and Martha was written down. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb. So they've already put Lazarus in the tomb for four days. They were just wailing at the house and crying. And that's why the crowd thought that Martha was going to the tomb to cry there. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. They were giving us background so that we know that if it's only two miles off, Jesus risked his own life, that he may be stoned to death, but yet I'm going to go to Bethany because Jesus loved Lazarus. In the very beginning of chapter 11, you can see when he says a certain man was healed, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister, Martha, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ornament and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was healed. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is healed. So Jesus loves Lazarus that he was willing to go to Bethany. And when he got there, Many of the Jews came to Matthew in verses um, 19 of John chapter 11. Many of the Jews came to Matthew and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Matthew heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Matthew said to Jesus, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died And as the conversation continue, but even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, he will give you. Jesus said to him, your brother will rise again. And Matthew said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me Though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Matthew, do you believe this? 
Jesus might be asking the same question to every single one of us here sitting. Do you believe this? When Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I don't know about you if you've ever come to a close encounter with death or if you know someone who has come to a close encounter with death or perhaps you know someone who just lost someone like the Garcia's family did. Death is a troubling thing. I was talking to one of um, a friend here the other night when we had the vigil Uh, for Pastor Andy and the family. And he told me three times that his son almost died and tears in his eyes, he was just wailing. He was so emotional because death almost claimed the life of his son. The profound truth about death is that it is irrespective of our age, whether we're young or old, our race, our gender, whether we're rich or poor, whether we are good or bad. It is inevitable that every human life will experience death. It's either sooner or later. And the reality is that you and I have no control as to when that will happen, how it will happen. We have no control of it. Death is something that is real. And even if someone takes their own life, they do not have this control over the circumstances that were in that decision that they made in taking their own life. God is in control of everything, and yet death also cannot be controlled by human It is inevitable, and death is a result of sin. Death came into this world the minute sin entered this world. In Romans chapter 5, verses 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Death is real. It could be scary to say that. People always love for us to speak about life. We will get to that in a minute. Let's face the reality of what death is and how it affects us. And how often do we think about it? Do we think as though it could happen to me today, tomorrow, next week? I don't think we do that. I think we plan ahead. And actually, the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastic chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, it said, a good name is better than precious ornament, and the day of death is what? Than the day of birth. The Bible is saying that the day that we die is actually better than the day we are born. Think about that for a minute. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, to the house of those who mourn, and to go to the house of feasting. Can you imagine the disciples telling Jesus to wait here and not go to Bethany? Because crowds were coming in chapter 10. He says a lot of people were coming and they were believing. Jesus could have stayed in Bethany and not have to go to Lazarus' home. But he did. He proved that he is the one who inspired this word. And going to the house of mourning, rather than feasting with his disciples and hiding away from, proves that Jesus knows everything about everything that is in this book. And he lives to the very truth of it. There's no shadow of doubt who he is. And then he says, for this is the end of all mankind. And the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. Is Jesus wise? Yes. Because his heart was in the house of those who were mourning. The wise among us here, our heart will be with the Garcia's family. 
or anyone that we know that mourn. But the house of the, the heart of the fool is in the house of men or mirth, the house of laughter. There's nothing wrong in laughing. There's nothing wrong in leaving life. And does this verse simply mean that we cannot go on leaving our lives? Does this verse restrict us from planning for our future? What does this simply mean? No. What it means is that we are not living according to the knowledge of this world. We are not living and clinging to everything as though everything here lasts forever. We are not going to leave without living in an eternal perspective. That is what it's all about. How do I leave my life eternal perspective? Not just for the here and now, because that is what the world does. The world out there does not leave eternally perspective, even though they will leave forever. <laughs> the reality is that none of us simply dies and we're done. Death is not the end of it. Some will die and come back to resurrected life, either to damnation or to life with Jesus Christ in a place where our joy is made full and there's pleasure forevermore. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, it says that the spirit returned to the God who gave it. So none of us really dies. We just go to the next place. Death is faster than a twinkle of an eye. The pain that you see someone may go through doesn't mean that they die. The moment they die and the soul leaves, it's so quick, so fast. I don't know if I would share some kind of weird things that I've seen in the past in my own life. I wouldn't want to creep anyone out. So I don't, I don't share those kind of stories. But if you want to know it, maybe you can talk to me. What did you say you see? <laughs> I'm very careful because I'm leery of people who tell me that they've seen things too. So when we know that this life isn't all there is and that we leave forever either to a life of damnation or to a life where we are given eternal life with God? I ask why the hustling and the bustling? Why do we live a life as though this is it like the world does? Why do we live a life where it is all about me, myself, and I, and I do not care how my action impacts the life of those around me? People of the world live that way. And they have no peace. They do not go to sleep at night. I'm not talking about insomnia now because I suffer from that too. Uh, the other day, I think I found myself waking up at 2.30, 3 a.m. And I'm like, dude, go to sleep. And then I realized at 10 p.m., I just drank a cup of coffee. <laughs> not a good idea. The peace that I'm talking about here is the peace of someone who cannot even think that this is it. I'm going to die tomorrow. Someone once said that if it costs you your peace, it is too expensive. It is too expensive. But the reality is that you and I cannot afford true peace. True peace comes only from the one who can give it. It comes only from Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Only Jesus can give a peace that the world does not have. Only Jesus can give us peace even in the moment of hard time and trial. Only Jesus can give resurrection life. So when Jesus was coming to Mary and Martha's house, he was going to bring them peace and comfort. He was going to give them hope. He was going to bring life to the death. A body that has been dead for four days. But not only was he going to bring peace and comfort to the family, 
Jesus was going to do something more profound, something more important than just giving life to a dead body that would eventually still die and ultimately, hopefully, that Lazarus, when he then come back to life, now believes that Jesus is the Messiah. What Jesus, was, his goal there was to give faith if you look at it, it's in actually we can flip our Bibles and see why did Jesus do what he did in John chapter 11 verses. Let's read it in context 14 and 15. Then Jesus told them plainly that Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that what you may believe. The most important reason why Jesus did what he did is so that people may know that he is the Messiah God promised to send. So that people may have faith and then be saved. That's why he did what he did. That they may know that Jesus has the power to raise the dead back to life. That's what resurrection means, that they may know that he is God who can give life. He is the embodiment of life. He is the resurrection and the life. Oftentimes, when people think about resuscitation, how science, let's give them a little credit. Science has come a long way. Science is really, um, I mean, if someone was going through a cardiac arrest in 60 years ago, I don't know, did they just pass away? I mean, you're the developed country. I just came in 12 years ago. So, <laughs> and every country look up to the development that happens in the Western world. But even though science has come a long way, resuscitation is never close to resurrection. They're two different things. When we resuscitate someone at the verge of death, it doesn't mean we have resurrection power. The world we live in today does not even have a clue that because God has given us the wisdom and the knowledge to do some things in the medical field, we then begin to think we have arrived and we are God. No, only God has the power to resurrect life. Only God has the power to give life. And even when we scientifically give someone a second chance so that when we attend to them and they didn't die, we only help them to leave. But we didn't give them true life. I don't know if I've told you this story before of a woman who who picked a boy up in the, in, a rude, um, in the hood, picked this boy up. He was born uh, paralyzed and he couldn't walk for many years. So she took the boy and after many surgery, the boy could walk again. But after the boy grew up, he committed one of the gr most grievous crime he, any human being can commit. Now the boy is in the penitentiary, in the federal uh, prison. She was telling her social worker friends the story, and they all thought that the boy would be a teacher or social worker just like her, but when she told them that the boy is in prison now, they were shocked. She said, God used me um, to give the boy the ability to walk but nobody was there to point the boy where to walk. And oftentimes, we think that when we give someone a second chance to leave, we forget that the most important part is not just a dead man walking, because that's what we all are. <laughs> a true life is in Christ. And without that, we are all just dead to sin. Every single one of us. Jesus is the resurrection and the life to those who have put their trust in him. He is the one who can give life because he is the embodiment of life itself. And indeed, for those of you who have believed in Jesus and are seated here, I want to give you a few reminders of who Christ is in our life and who we are in him. We are fully aware and we should be aware as Christians that we have a fragile life. 
Our life is very fragile. We are here today and gone tomorrow. The book of James chapter 4 verse 14 says, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist, more so a vapor, that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. We have that understanding because we read God's word. But we also know that death has lost its sting. As believers, we are no longer afraid of death. Death is not something that robs us of our joy and our peace. Because what would they do? They would kill this body, Jesus said, but they cannot kill the soul. It says, do not be afraid of those who can kill this body, but no ability to kill the soul. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, it says that death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. As believers, we also recognize that this world is not our final destination. We are on a journey. Our true home is where Christ is. Our true hope is in Christ. That's where our home is. I'm just a passerby. This is a marketplace. Everyone is beating on what they want to buy. But you know what? I beat too. But ultimately, my treasure is in heaven. We also know that because in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. For it is, uh, if, it's where, if it were not so, would I not have told you? So that where I go, to a place where I go, that you too may be. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. That's our hope. That's our hope. Paul in another place said, if this life was all there is and there is no eternal life after this, we of all people should be more pitiable. Because this is not all there is. When we leave as though this is all there is, this life, as though this is it, then we will simply leave. Um, then we will simply leave for the here and the now, rather than also believing that every day that God gives to me is a blessing and an opportunity for me to be a blessing to those around me. When we have eternal perspective, that our lives will be resurrected again, our body will be resurrected, and we will be reunited to the life giver, Jesus Christ himself, then every day that I live on this earth becomes a blessing and an opportunity for me to bless those around me. Yesterday, my mother-in-law and I, <laughs> we were having a quick discussion about her chicken frame in the kitchen. <laughs> if you know my mother-in-law, she's a fan of chicken, and my father-in-law does a great job of encouraging that, but he's just stopped after 200 chickens in the house. <laughs> <laughs> but there's this frame in the kitchen, and that frame said, each day is a gift from God. And so I ask, why is each day a gift from God? And we had a little theological talk on that. But we quickly realized that each day is a day so that for the one who is saved to live a life that brings glory and honor to God. For the one who is not saved, we who are saved become the light to them so that they may know of a God who loves them. So therefore, each day becomes a blessing to those of us who have put our trust in Jesus. And now the life that we live, we live to the glory of God. 
as we patiently anticipate the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our hope. And when we have this hope, when we have this hope, it gives us peace. It doesn't mean that trials doesn't come. It doesn't mean that tribulations don't come into our lives. It doesn't mean that the enemy doesn't attack the most things with love, our loved ones. It just means that even in those trying times, our hope and peace is secured only in Christ. Yes, we grieve. Yes, we mourn. But we know that we serve a God who is the resurrection and the life. And when the enemy brings death into our lives, when the enemy brings things that looks uncomfortable, Jesus brings resurrection to dry bones. Jesus has the ability to do that. I don't know what you're going through in your life. Maybe things are dead in some areas of your life. You can cast your cares on him because he cares for you. You can trust that he is the resurrection and the life and nothing really is dead in your life if you are in Christ. It may not look good in your own face, but God is working all things together for our good and for his glory. Everything. It didn't say some things. It says everything. When Jesus was coming to Matthew's house, It looks bad to everyone who sat there. They wail, they cry. But in his eyes, everything is going to come together for their good. There was going to be a joy in that home when Lazarus was called to come out. And life was given to a dead body. Imagine what could go on there. It says that many people believed. In fact, this miracle was so enormous that the religious leaders saw people trooping and going to Jesus now. That they said, we need to kill him and even kill Lazarus. That miracle that Jesus did to give a resurrection to a dead body, to resurrect that body. And not only did he resurrect the physical body. Resurrection is a physical thing. It's just coming back to life. The second part of it is that life. Resurrection is that he came back to life, but life now is that he now has life in Christ. That is faith. That is true life. That is the life that we long for. For those of us who are yet to believe, that is the life that Christ offers you today. He is life. This world is a dark place. Everything is dead. Only Christ brings life to it. Every single thing you see, it isn't the outward that he looks. It's the heart. The moment we have life in Christ, it impacts our physical world and the way that we see things. When Andy texted me, or texted the group, the hope that they have in even thanking God for the 27 years they've spent with Sophia. There's a peace that they have in when the body of Christ came all alongside to pray for them. We ignite that hope in them. We help them to know that they are loved and they are cherished and that they have that peace that only comes from God. We know that Christ is the resurrection and the life. If Jesus was to ask you that same question, do you believe? Do you believe, Martha? I want you to put your name there. Do you believe, Olu? Do you believe, Donna? Put your name in there when Jesus asks you that same question. Are we going to be so courageous like Martha was when she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world, who has come. 
it's an English way of translating, even in my Yoruba language, there are many ways that English is just not very so helpful the way that you guys translate stuff. <laughs> but what this is saying is, Jesus has been promised to come as the Messiah, and now we know that you have come, you are coming, and you've come. In King James, it said that who has come into the world? Martha professed that. He, she professed that Jesus is the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And as the uh, worship team make their way up, let me conclude in this. Jesus is indeed the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the door of the sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus is the true vine. There is no one like him. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end, the alpha and omega. He is God almighty, and there is none like him. Jesus is the one who can give you true life. And in that life that he gives you lies your peace, your hope, and your, your joy. Do you believe this? If you're here today and you're yet to believe this, every day is an opportunity for you to do so. God is giving you the grace to see another day. The question is, do you believe this? And to those of us who have believed this, let's live in that light of what we now believe, that Jesus will give resurrection to everything that is dead in my life, and he is my life because he is life. Let us pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, King of glory, we thank you because you are the resurrection and the life. You are able to give life to dead, dead, decaying things. You are able to resurrect us to life in you. Lord, we thank you for the Garcia's family. We are praying for healing. We are praying for a time of grieving. We are praying for your peace. You will remind them that Sophia has just been upgraded to a place where we all long to be. So Lord, we thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with us? Oh